As world leaders are convening virtually for what is likely to be one of the most important summits on biodiversity in the decade, the COP15, people are paying more attention to biodiversity, a critical area of sustainability that is often overlooked. China, as one of the 17 recognized megadiverse countries in the world, has elevated biodiversity conservation to a national strategy. The European Union has also stepped up by placing a biodiversity strategy at the core of its flagship Green Deal. Today, CGTN is partnering with Europe's biggest news channel, Euronews, for a panel discussion on the urgent issue of how to protect, preserve, and restore biodiversity on our planet. This program is also part of CGTN's Global Arena series. I'm Xu Jindu, and I will be hosting from CGTN in Beijing, China. My name is Jeremy Wilkes, and I will be hosting from Euronews in Lyon, France. This is a unique international collaboration between our channels, a rare chance for you to hear voices from the East and the West as the world meets virtually this week for the first part of the UN Biodiversity Conference in Kunming in China. Let's introduce our guests. Well, joining me today at the CGTN are Ma Jun, Director with the Institute of Public and Environmental Affairs, and Dr. Li Lian, Director of Global Policy and Advocacy at WWF International. And here at Euronews, we are pleased to welcome Miriam Boomeran, head of the political and research section on ecology and biodiversity at UNESCO in Paris, and Josef Satella, professor of ecology at the Helmholtz Center for Environmental Research in Germany and co-chair of the 2019 Global Assessment at IPBES, the Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services. We'll start with uh, Dr. Li Lian. I know that uh, President Xi Jinping gave a, a keynote speech on biodiversity at the summit of COP15. You were there at the site listening to his speech. So what's your takeaway? I think I have uh, two biggest takeaways. One is President Xi Jinping talk about the managing the global biodiversity that China is seeking for acting in country, but also seeking global cooperation. That's one thing. Second big uh, takeaways that he announced many and uh, many uh, four areas of uh, action in China, but one uh, from China, but one significantly is uh, uh, he committed 1.5 billion RMB to, is to establish a Kunming Biodiversity Fund and also welcome other countries to join. I think the significant the significance of his announcement is that the developing countries, the, the non-developed countries um, like China, China still uh, in the developing country state uh, per capita status is taking action and is calling for action together. I think that is very significant. Well, uh, Ma Jun, you know, uh, China is one of the megadiverse uh, in terms of bi biodiversity countries, you know. Uh, it harbors nearly 10% of plant species and 14% of animal species on Earth. If it goes back uh, 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 further away from like in 20. Uh, 12, um, you know, China mentioned uh, this uh, idea of uh, ecological civilization. Uh, so, Ma Jun, from your point of view, you know, uh, now President Xi is making more uh, promises of building, you know, national parks and uh, more efforts against the climate change. Uh, you know, what do you see China is putting its mission of achieving those targets into action? Yeah, China is working on this and um, ecological civilization has again been highlighted uh, in this uh, uh, biodiversity uh, COP meeting. And uh, uh, this is the first, first time for any international gathering, a major gathering to, with the theme of uh, ecological civilization. I think uh, uh, President Xi again uh, highlighted this uh, in his speech. Uh, I think ecological civilization means to uh, something, uh, to, tr uh, to be a transcendence uh, of industrial civilization. And China has upheld uh, this eco civilization as one of its fundamental social economic development uh, principles, uh, uh, which by itself is, uh, uh, is uh, a, an action to uh, fulfill the uh, you know, mainstreaming uh, the biodiversity. Um, and when, when this idea had been written into Chinese constitution and uh, um, and 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 t today, you know, China has um, uh, there has been some uh, uh, some concrete measures taken in China, uh, such as the logging ban, uh, 
uh, of natural forest, returning farmlands and forests to, uh, to, to forests and grassland, and establishing national parks and um, uh, water pollution control. And China have, uh, uh, have, have conducted that in, in a massive way. And then, uh, of course, a 10-year fishing ban uh, uh, in the entire Yangtze River, uh, Yangtze River Basin. All these are concrete measures, and through these measures, uh, we have seen the uh, uh, some of the the trend of biodiversity losses are being checked in uh, many parts of China, and uh, some of the flagship species flagship ship species uh, uh, gradually coming back, including the, the number of panda and, uh, uh, and and Tibetan antelopes. Joseph, um, I would like to come to you now. Um, from a European perspective, we're hearing this good news of initiatives in China, but we also know that this conference in Kunming was actually delayed because of the coronavirus, and that pandemic broke out, we think, because of encroachment of mankind onto natural areas. Do you think that we've learnt lessons from what happened with COVID-19? Well, I think the first step uh, we did as a global community, we have been made aware of the importance of natural systems, which are more or less undisturbed, or let's say only slightly disturbed or used by men, uh, as a basis for human well being, that means for the prevention of this kind of ep epidemics and later pandemics. So I think the first step was really that it gets into people's mind, which is the case, at least it also in many leaders of countries. I know it from Germany, I know it from the European Union, for example. But it's still quite some way to really, let's say, derive the consequences. So we are now, let's say, discussing in Beijing and also in the next year, I think, uh, how to deal with nature. And I guess it is very important that we really preserve nature and to, let's say, have the high amount of natural areas and avoid destruction of forests, for example, in order to also take care of our own health. So it will still take a while in people's mind, but I think we are on the good way. OK, so it's kind of filtering through. Um, question for Mariam. Uh, we know we had this delay. Was there progress on the sidelines in terms of coming up with a, a good deal for biodiversity? Or have we actually just been delaying things and not really getting to the decisions we need to get to? Well, I will agree with uh, Joseph that um, there is a, an awareness, unprecedented awareness about our interdependence with nature and uh, the ecosystems and biodiversity with that crisis. So it's important that um, that this focus remains the same until there is disagreement that is going to be a sign in Kunming next year, but beyond until we achieve the 2030 uh, target that all the governments have committed to. And also we have learned, we have seen, we have observed, so it's a very good news for what the president of China has announced yesterday that the countries are able to work together and to mobilize massive amount of funds to fix the crisis. So there is a hope and an opportunity, and especially during this virtual summit, but until the agreement in coming next year, that the governments will really invest, but also implement their commitment. And that's the crucial lessons that we have to learn from the past and from the uh, Aishi targets we need funds, we need commitment, political commitment, but we need also the resources to implement what the countries and us as citizens have committed to. Well, uh, Marjorie, if you look at the general picture, I have some figures here. The International Union for a Conservation of a Nature Red List of Threatened Species, they recently showed that 28% you know, of the species they assessed face the threat of extinction, 79 uh, species are extinct in the wild. Uh, more than 8,000 are critically endangered. Over 14,000 are endangered. And over 15,000 are vulnerable. And close to 8,000 are nearly uh, threatened. How do you make of those numbers, Marjorie? Yeah, those, uh, those numbers are, uh, reflect uh, the current situation that despite all the efforts made by the international community, uh, we haven't seen the turning point um, on, on biodiversity. Uh, you know, over the past 50 years, uh, we have seen a massive development, enormous development of humanity, you know, with the world population doubling and, um, uh, and, and world economy grow exponentially. But in the meantime, uh, uh, according to the Living Planet uh, uh, report, uh, we have seen uh, a, a nearly 
60 percent, around 60 percent of uh, of losses of the population of mammals, uh, uh, birds, rep, reptiles, amphibians, and uh, um, and 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 also, you know, Joseph, I think is coming from evidence, and according to their statistics, uh, uh, one million, you know, out of eight million uh, species are actually uh, uh, facing the risk of ex extinction at uh, about half of them over the next a few decades. So this situation is uh, uh, extremely serious. And um, uh, in China, I mentioned about all the successes, but we also have very, very sad losses uh, uh, when uh, the Yangtze River dolphin, uh, the Baiji, uh, you know, uh, was announced to be uh, uh, functionally um, uh, extinct to have uh, have gone extinct uh, as a, as a major freshwater mammal. Um, this is just one of the um, uh, uh, hard lessons that we must learn, and uh, it should serve as a wake up call. Mm -hmm. Well, Mariam, I have a silly question. You know, some people would say every fifty to one hundred million years uh, there will be. A massive extinction, you know, 75 to 95 percent of the species were simply gone. And people say that could be part of the natural uh, evolution or natural selection. And why should we, the human beings, somehow trying so hard to intervene uh, that uh, natural process? Yes, um, life uh, is, is inclu including death. And uh, we, we see also the, the different cycle of nature. So this is part that you have uh, natural extinctions. But what is really new and alarming is that it's very uh, accelerating process like never before. And the reports from the science, from IBES, from IPCC, have clearly demonstrated that it's human induced. Like the terrestrial ecosystems are altered because of human activities, because of land use, land use changes, because of agriculture, because of uh, industry. Uh, because of transportation, because of climate change also. That is the recent events that we have observed, for example, in Europe with the fires and, uh, and the floods were proven to be induced by human uh, activities and the way we live on Earth and we manage ecosystems. So this is what is important to understand, is that this time it's not like before. Humans are responsible for what is happening. And so if humans are responsible, humans can and shall fix it. And if you think about 50 million years from now, I don't care really because it's so so far in the future. We have to talk about the next decades or something like this, maybe next hundred years, not to let's say let's say risk the extinction of our own species. So this 15 million thing is quite interesting, let's say uh, academically, but that's something which is far beyond our horizon. So it's about our survival at least for the next yeah years, decades, centuries to come. I'd like to put a question to. Um... Uh, Lee Lin, which is about this move to have a crime of ecocide, because we have courts which try people for genocide, crimes against other humans. Should we try and really push that forward and have the carrot and stick approach? Because we've heard some good moves, establishing uh, uh, new national parks, um, investing in uh, restoring ecosystems, but shouldn't we also have prosecutions for things which have gone just very badly wrong and where biodiversity has been damaged badly as well? What do you think? So let me start with what is the biodiversity? What is the ecosystem we're in? It's actually including the genetic resort, genetic informations that the carrot evolving as a human being as all other species go on. It's including the wildlife uh, for animals and the plants. It's also including the ecosystems, the services that them forming together, supporting us. This is really fundamental for a whole human being, for all the other life on the earth to sustain, to thrive. So without ecosystems, without the services that are providing, like the air, like the pure water, like the you know regulated climate, we would not be able to survive or thrive. So what we cannot treat the nature system as if they are just for us disposal. So in a way we cannot really kill them because once we kill them, we kill ourselves. We're basically sitting on a branch of a tree and cutting the branch away. And this is all about what we are treating with nature. So we talk about we human being has a right to healthy environment. The UN uh, Human Rights Council has just passed a resolution uh, a week ago, talking about 
really the unanimous openness. Most majority countries voted that human being, we have a right for healthy environment. I think that we have a right for healthy environment, it's right, but we also need to protect the environment, the nature that sustain us. I think fight, you know, go a war against nature, human will not win. We need to really live in peace with nature. Therefore, we cannot destroy, we cannot kill off those diversity ecosystems, the safety web that we are all relying on. But what about taking these cases to court then? I mean, because that seems to be a way that could really make a change because it's going to be very motivating. There are, there are cases where the damaging to nature has been taken to the court and get a really good benefit to the environment. There's a one case outside of offshore of Australia where the oil company leaking the oil into the ocean, which is really damaging the coral reef that really sustain many other uh, ocean species. So they were brought to court and then the action was stopped and then compensation was made to the people and to nature. I think, yes. When we see the crime against nature, they should be brought to court and then they should be prosecuted. That can set the precedency that others should not do the same. We have to really work with nature other than against nature. Uh, can I just uh, weigh in, uh, you know, with uh, uh, with, a, uh, with Chinese uh, perspective, you know, uh, 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 public interest litigation has been uh, uh, put into upheld uh, by the uh, legislation. Uh, the new legislation in China and uh, uh, environmental NGOs uh, have been uh, granted uh, the uh, status to uh, to file uh, lawsuit against, uh, uh, of course, the, pollu the polluters, but also uh, those who uh, who damage and destroy ecosystem. And uh, in China, we have uh, 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 one major local uh, NGO, the Friends of Nature filed a very classic case against a hydropower company uh, who tried to build um, a dam uh, that uh, that will uh, uh, that that threat to uh, to the to the biodiversity uh, to the to the habitat of uh, a endangered species the green the peacock and um, uh, and and they they have uh, uh, won this case and the uh, the project uh, has has been now being cancelled. Yeah. Should we be doing the same kind of thing? Are we doing the same kind of thing in Europe, um, Josef? Well, I think we have laws which are sometimes quite strict, so we have chances to persecute uh, those destroying the environment. I think we are doing this already to some extent, and don't know how much is really kind of a useful, a good balance. But I guess as, as soon or as long as you have laws which, uh, let's say, allow you to be punished for environmental crimes, it helps you also not to commit the crime, at least to, let's say, show that we as a community, as a society, as a European society, are taking care of this one. So I think it's good to have it. It's not the only solution, but it's one important component in the, in the legal perspective. Interesting. Uh, Miriam, you know, here's a question. Uh, on one hand, uh, we see we are in a kind of a biodiversity crisis. We see species, you know, millions of them could disappear, you know. At the same time, we do see the protection of some of the animals. Uh, for example, giant panda, you know, Asian elephants, uh, the mangrove forests, uh, they are well protected. In particular, the giant panda, for example, over the past uh, 30 plus years, the Chinese government has made uh, great efforts uh, to recover. Uh, you know, that then we see the wild population of giant panda is actually, uh, has actually doubled. And the Chinese government has did, uh, announced in July that, uh, you know, they are not endangered animal anymore. So are there any experiences we can share, you know, from country to country in protecting uh, the species? Yes, absolutely. Um, I think it's important to, 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 um, to say that conservation works and that uh, some of the protected area and the reserves that were established are really indeed working. And that again, humans can help to uh, reintroduce some species that were disappearing. I think about the example in a, a transboundary biosphere reserve uh, between France and Germany, when there was the lynx that was reintroduced successfully and uh, they had some babies recently. Or the same story in uh, Delta du Rhone biosphere reserve in south of France where thanks to some researchers and scientists, they have established some artificial island for nesting of the pink flamingo. And now since 60 years, uh, they are coming back and nesting and it's not anymore endangered. So there are success stories. 
uh, it's good to focus on some emblematic species, but the real now um, issue is that biodiversity is not something that is only, you know, far away, exotic, or focusing on species. It's really about all this interaction that we've been talking about, interaction between the genetic diversity, interaction between this genetic diversity and the species that we are talking about, and this interaction between those species and the ecosystems, and then this ecosystem that we humans are able to manage, and through agriculture, through farming, through grazing, and this is all this interaction between all these different levels that makes the complexity of biodiversity, but the beauty of life and why on earth we are able, we as human species, to be able to live in the interaction, in harmony, hopefully, with the other living species. So there are success stories. We should build on this. We should follow and implement the scientific recommendation. We, we know the situation. We have the facts. We have the data. So it's a question of now to really change and transform our habits, our way of living on Earth, and to not allow anymore to destroy or to extract or to be destructive, and really to live in harmony with nature to the way we manage the different ecosystems, and including in urban cities. This is really also important that biodiversity is not only in a particular area far away, it's also where we live. And this is also the concept of the biosphere reserve, it's connected spaces. And this is one of the recommendations from the post 2020. We need to connect those protected areas with the larger landscape where people are living. People are living on this planet everywhere. So everywhere in every ecosystems, we should be able to live in harmony with nature, not only in protected area that, uh, that is really important, but not enough. Mm -hmm. um, can, I, can I add yeah, to, go ahead, to that? Yeah. Yeah. I like to add what Miriam said about you know man uh, relation with nature conservation is really critical across the world across the species that we are working with. But most importantly, we we all know the drivers of biodiversity loss are more of one of our humanity's actions, including the land use, including over exploration, climate change, invasive species. So we can protect as much we can, but if we are not transforming our living consumption production style and our financial style, the more encroaching, the more threat will be put on nature. So the biodiversity conservation will not really uh, generate the results we'd like to see. Therefore, looking at our relationship with nature, we also need to look in, into back to our production consumption uh, patterns, our how we produce food, how we put, you know how we entertain ourselves, how we you know manage our supply chain. So all that together, we are able to really make sure the nature thrive to survive us to sustain us to thrive. I think looking back, the drivers of biodiversity is a critical. We see the conservation uh, area, conservation uh, awareness are growing, but I think it's still a long way to go to really looking into ourselves, looking into our production consumption pattern to really go to transformative economic reform. That's really needed, but I see that is just starting. So we need to really work it all together towards that. A question for our guests here in Europe. I'm curious about what you think about the biodiversity strategy for 2030 from the European Union. We've got a, a list of kind of tools that they want to deploy to try and improve biodiversity, restoring rivers, um, reversing the decline of pollinators, reducing the use of pesticides, planting trees. Is that it, really? Is that what we've got in the toolbox? Is that all we can do, Josef? Well, these are, let's say, some important components of what we could and should do. I guess the overall thing is, of course, the economic question, like Lilin has just pointed out, is about the indirect drivers. So we have to look at our economy, of how we run the whole system. And then, of course, we hope to see effects, which we then, for example, monitor. We look at pollinators as one indicator. We look at how they survive. I think it's uh, the whole picture is a bit larger. It's not only these tools. It's just these tools are, let's say, components with which or through which we're going to see how successful we are. But also these are tools which we use to, let's say, hopefully achieve progress, like in the restoration. So the decade of restoration is now proclaimed in the European Union. So we're trying to do lots in restoration. We always say we have to be careful not to forget conservation in this context. So not to lose the things which are there already, just to restore things which are lost already. So that's quite important to have both, to have the balance. So for me, priority is uh, conserving systems and then going into restoration. Uh, just coming back to the examples mentioned before, I mean, the system, if you look at, let's say, designing ecosystems like doing conservation measures, uh, 
these can be, let's say, nice, good exercises to bring across the main messages to people and also to, let's say, show how these indirect drivers, if you modify them, uh, have effects on our conservation. So if you look at the landscape, we have this kind of cultural landscapes in Asia, in Europe, all over the globe, which are driven by man for a long time already. And many of these areas, even the conservation areas, are uh, kind of old land use systems. So if you, for example, look at the consumption of, of meat in Europe, if you reduce this one, you have very win-win aspect because you can still maintain very diverse uh, ecosystems which are dependent on grazing. You can avoid too much, uh, let's say, greenhouse gas emissions. You have, let's say, uh, animal welfare and you reduce the export of extinction into other countries because you can produce more locally. So that's one example where you say we have a local, uh, let's say, approach to conservation, which looks like looking at symptoms, but in the end, it can be very nicely linked to the, let's say, back to the background, to the indirect drivers, which are important yet. In this case, it's lifestyle and consumption. But the report that you were involved with from 2018 was basically saying the main drivers of biodiversity loss are, are, are climate change, invasive species, urbanisation. All of those things are somewhat inevitable. Whatever gets decided in Glasgow, climate change is going to carry on for the rest of this century, probably. Um, invasive species are linked to climate change as well and to human activity and to trade. And urbanisation is part of that model. So, uh, Miriam, it sounds like there's an... Uh, uh, if you look at that data, it's surely kind of a pessimistic picture, isn't it? Well, it is in a way, but it's also a, an opportunity for us um, to... Um, to question, uh, as was said by, by the other speakers, our life choice and our consumptions and production lifestyles. It's interesting to note that there are lots of initiatives everywhere in the planet, in every ecosystems, where people are um, trying to address all these di different, what we call in, in science, uh, indirect drivers and direct drivers about how we, the land use, how we consume, how we produce. Let me take one example from the EU that is interesting. It's this uh, a strategy of from farm to fork that I have observed everywhere in all the, the UNESCO designated sites where you really make a holistic approach. You connect everything. Um, the big change is not to think in silos anymore. Like this is, uh, biodiversity is the responsibility of the Ministry of Environment. No, it's also the responsibility of the Ministry of Finance, of economy, of industry, of agriculture. If we are able to change that mindset that the living, the life-bearing systems that we are all depending upon are a responsibility and that every minister and all governments are accountable for maintaining and transmitting this potential to the present and the future generation, then we are talking about the major breakthrough. And then this initiative at the EU from farm to fork is connecting that. Who are the farmers? How do they produce? What do they produce? How do they produce the meat, for example? And then how does it go to the, to the consumer that we are? How does, do you make a kind of cycle between them and the restaurants, including in the urban cities? If people are more aware about the choices they have, they can select who, what they buy, what they consume, that they know that the consequences of their choices is having a positive impact on biodiversity or not. And this is the change that we are talking about. And this is also what it, UNESCO is experiencing in, in, in its different network. Uh, you have alliance in uh, Italy, for example, between five biosphere reserves and the producer, the farmers, the citizens, the hotel and the restaurants. And so this is this kind of holistic cycle where everybody knows what are the consequences of their action on the other that is the life cycle. And this is how we're going to be able to transform, as I said, the way we live. So there are solutions. It's not doom. There are ways that we can transform all the key sectors, transportation, energy, food, health. There are ways and solutions all around the world. Mm -hmm. Well, Miriam says it's not doomed. You know, every individual has a role to play. But obviously, governments and the countries have a larger, a bigger role to play. If you look at the record, unfortunately, it's, uh, it's far from being ideal. For example, the 20 Aichi uh, conservation uh, targets uh, you know, made in Japan in 2010. If you look at the record of countries uh, fulfilling those targets, uh, basically, they have failed nearly all of them. As to Ma Juan, you know, what are the reasons? Are those targets somehow unrealistic, impossible to realize? 
I think a major part of that is uh, is because um, uh, most of the countries uh, have not quite um, uh, uh, actually uh, put um, uh, biodiversity protection as a uh, as a priority. So we put um, all these targets, ambitious targets, uh, on paper, uh, but uh, but they they're not supported uh, by the you know from legislation to government policy and then. Also, the uh, money, uh, the investment, uh, has not come uh, along with that. Uh, um, I think all this uh, uh, has a lot to do with uh, with the failure of uh, to achieve the the first main goals of the IHG uh, target, that is uh, to mainstream uh, biodiversity, and um, uh, and and that's um, uh, that's a hard lesson. And then, secondly, we haven't quite uh, uh, valued. Uh, you know the the nat nature's uh, uh, contribution. You know when whenever there's a conflict between development uh, and uh, environmental protection, the uh, environment got sidelined uh, because we we haven't recognized uh, the tremendous uh, contribution uh, by nature to um, to the uh, uh, to to the economy and uh, uh, to the uh, uh, livelihood of the people I mean, even just from a human development uh, perspective uh, we need to recognize uh, that uh, uh, 75 percent of the food crops uh, need uh, biodiversity you know for pollination more than 75 percent of uh, all the fresh water coming from the healthy um, uh, uh, healthy uh, forest and uh, uh, and, and half of the world's population depend on the uh, nature for their uh, livelihood. So um, uh, I hope that uh, uh, the IG lessons could be taken in a serious way. And uh, this time, uh, let's uh, really, uh, you know, from 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 COP15, you know, uh, more government and uh, uh, all the global society need to pay more attention to. Mm -hmm. Well, Li Ling, you know, as Marjorie said, you know, the focus, uh, let's say, now we're focusing on the government. Um, uh, at the UN, one UN official, I think his name is David Cooper, he said uh, a few days back that basically criticized the national governments around the world. He said most of them are spending on subsidizing activities that are detrimental to biodiversity instead of spending on preserving biodiversity. What is going on? Is there a lack of a political will, uh, you know, awareness, public awareness in basically m most parts of the world? We are seeing a mixed picture. So we, we do have some countries putting investment in nature, in harming to nature more than through the subsidies, through investment, more than they invest in conserving the uh, nature. We also do see the groundswell moves of many governments coming together. I'll give you one example. One recent, uh, the past couple of years we observed, observed. So at this moment, there are 92 head of states. So 91 plus one EU as one of them. They they call the leaders, they have made the leaders pledge for nature last year, this time. And then this year they renewed their commitment. They calling for a building a uh, reverse loss of nature for a nature positive world for the sustainable development. And that has a 10 commitments. And then one of them is really building the, uh, making the global biodiversity framework, ambitious, strong transformation, and also including addressing the drivers, as I mentioned, conservation and drivers. It's conservation, as Mira mentioned, also the drivers. And the, basically ecological footprint, we need to really bring them down. That including the, you know, reform the financial um, uh, systems, uh, subsidy systems. That's one, only one of them. And the President Duque uh, from Colombia, I just mentioned that they uh, initiated by, by Colombia, later now joined by 72 countries. They, they formed a high ambition coalition calling for conserving 30% of, of land and ocean on the planet. And there's also Global Ocean Alliance with 30, 31 countries joining to conserve you know, protect 30% of the ocean. All those countries adding together, you know, because they were all lapping between countries, they're totally 100 countries representing 42% of global GDP and 31% of the global population committed to really make, make transformative changes to conserve the, few, the, 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 the future that we like. The challenge now is how can we land this global political ambitions 
onto the global decision, which is a global biodiversity framework that's going to be uh, negotiated, agreed um, April this year. I think that's critical, critical element. One more, I just want to say, not only the government is now working, we also see business, business player, both, you know, positive and negative role to nature, right? There are some now business, there is a quite coalitional business, uh, including business for nature, gathering more than a thousand business are coming to call for the government to really taking seriously of nature and they are willing to do that. And there's a new CEO letter from business for nature businesses just issued, I think a couple of days ago. And then adding to that, the population, general population also, their awareness, their action are also changing. So the Economic Intelligence Unit um, that we are working with them to do a survey across like 20, 27, I think 27, 20 something countries to look at the awareness, to look at their willingness to take action. Uh, one important figure that I, I was really impressed, so I'd like to share is that in the past, when you're asking people's willingness to pay with a premium of environmental product, they usually willing to pay, but the actual behavior doesn't say that way. So this time they do differently. They use the search as indication about action. So they look at the, uh, the, this 20 something countries, how pop general population is searching the word environmental crisis, also searching environmental product. Because if you think about you're searching for environment product, you are more willing to buy, right? To take action. So those number of past five, past five years will see a significant increase, 40 something, 72%. I just want to say that people are ready. Government as, as leaders have shown, business leaders are already stepping up. We need to really use you use the COP15, use this global biodiversity framework opportunity, which is a one in a decade, one maybe in a millennium opportunity to really put our commitment, action onto the decision so that whole country, all country can go back to implement. To really, for sustainable development, which 2030 will have to deliver, where nature is really the fundamental for all of that. So I see hope. We hear a lot about this goal of 30 by 30, and you were talking a lot about goals there, and you hear about it in Europe, um, protecting basically 30% of land and water by 2030. We've had countries in Europe commit to it, the Americans are committing to it. Is that a good goal, and is it something we're going to get signed uh, next year? Um, question to um, Josef, what, what do you think? Well, it's surely, well, it's a, it's a convention, of course. Yet we agreed on something which is now the 30 uh, by 30 goal. I think it's a good goal because it really helps to preserve quite a lot of, let's say, important biodiversity and ecosystems and their, and their services and functions. Uh, I mean, when try, uh, mainstreaming the entire ideas, it's a bit more tricky. Of course, if you take Germany as an example, we have this 30% goal as well. We're discussing right now, negotiating who will be the next government. So it's also playing a role here. And there, people first think about, let's say, 30% of the land which can be used by people, which is not the case in our country, of course. It's about 30% of land which are a bit like man and biosphere-like activities, let's put it like this, where you have, let's say, traditional land use systems, you have, uh, let's say, more uh, original primary systems, but mainly land use systems, which are kind of, let's say, not very intensive, but also not abandoned, which creates this high diversity. And this is the part which uh, should become part of these nature conservation areas, this 30%. It's a matter of communication. As long as you only talk about conservation, people often think about fenced things. It's still in the attitude. So that's something that we have to really bring across the message. What does it really mean? And this means different things in different countries. But I guess all across Europe, I think even globally, the 30 by 30% 30 goal is a quite important one in order to make real progress towards the conservation of biodiversity and, and ecosystems. I suppose it makes us think that we're going to have a kind of 30% of kind of reserves that are untouchable and then everything else can be exploited. The 70% that, that's left behind. Um, sorry, um, Lilian, you, want, you wanted to come in on that. Yeah, I just continue on this. So 30% is not a each country's 30%. It's a global goal. So the, so if therefore it's a global, so some countries have reached power, there is more than 30%, we should protect more than 30%. That's the one thing. The question will be where and how to measure that, right? Then to your question, what about the other 70%? No, the other 70% is not we discard them. We need to sustainably manage the rest. We'll protect the best, sustainably manage the rest. And that's really how human beings have to work together. The last point I want to say is that this 30% is not ring fencing to say, you put it together, no touch by human. No, this is not a way. I think I think all the, what comes into the 30%, including 
strict protection, as we mentioned, some biodiversity should be protected that way, but also should include other effective conservation measures that could be you know, managed by local communities, indigenous, indigenous people, because they are managing, I guess, the vast majority of the lands which has the richest biodiversity. Therefore, we need to really see the new way of protecting our nature and the living in harmony with nature in a way through the strict conservation, but also collaborating uh, with you know other effective conservation measures to be able to uh, look, you know, conserve the best still and the sustainable managed rest. So we have the whole planet sustainably um, managed, conserved for whole, whole, for whole human being and for other lives who share the planet with us. Can I bring in Ma Jun though? Who's going to police this? If you actually do this, you say you're going to have protect 30% of the planet. Who's the police force for this? Who's going to make sure that it's actually going to happen? Because we know that that's a, a great problem. We're declaring parks and saying this is going to be protected and then nobody's looking out for it. Yeah, you're right, Jeremy. I think in different countries, the, uh, um, the power of enforcement, uh, the level of enforcement usually varied. Uh, so, um, and, and uh, we're, we're just, but it's encouraging to see that uh, uh, in more recent years, uh, uh, environmental laws and regulations uh, have been, uh, uh, the enforcement has been vastly strengthened uh, in China. Uh, and uh, uh, the, uh, over the past few years, Chinese, uh, not just, uh, you know, as I mentioned, some of the, the NGOs can brought cases to the, to the court, um, but also the central government in China have sent tens of thousands uh, over the past several years uh, to, uh, to, to, the, uh, to different regions uh, to try to uh, you know, go through the inspection, identify not just the polluters and eco uh, damages, but also uh, those government officials who failed this, uh, uh, their, their duties. Uh, and uh, uh, this accountability system uh, uh, is, uh, is being built. And last but not least, I think, um, you know, we also need uh, need to recognize that people can play, the public can play a major role in this. And, you know, uh, with uh, through the, through, but, but they must be informed. So our organization, IPE, is working with our partners uh, to depict uh, China's 25% um, uh, ecological zones, you know, 10 to 25% of the land and territorial waters. Uh, uh, we try to depict that on our blue map uh, database, uh, side by side with the information of uh, all the local air and water quality data, and also the geologic location and environmental performance uh, of, uh, now we put 5 million uh, companies on the digital map. Um, uh, overlap that with the uh, red line zones, and we hope to uh, provide this uh, uh, to you know uh, this uh, this visualized uh, information to the public, especially to the uh, to the business, as uh, Dr. Li Lin uh, cited, uh, that it's in extremely important uh, uh, to involve the business uh, uh, because you know now uh, now they are responsible for much of the impact, but they also have the resources to deal with that. Uh, if we can have the data to empower them, enable them to grain their supply chain and uh, grain the global investment uh, um, to integrate all these uh, ecological uh, uh, factors into their business decision making, that's extremely important. Now the complicated part is that uh, this goes beyond the boundary. You know, now much of the impact is caused by this globalized uh, uh, manufacturing, sourcing, and investment. Uh, so I think information technology and the transparency is uh, can be a game changer over the next 10 years. Mm -hmm. uh, well, Dr. Li Lin, you know, China ha is adopting a strategy of uh, ecological conservation red lines, uh, and uh, it has designated, as Marjun said, you know, 25% of its area as red line area. I'm wondering, you know, we previously we talked about 30% in most developed countries as protected land. Are they, how are they different? So when China does not get in the ecological conservation red line, the, the criteria looking at is really to conserve the uh, endangered species, the critical ecosystem services, and also disaster uh, prevention. Uh, 
so, so that's the 25 you have seen. Uh, what we are working with China as through different channels to look to build in the, the carbon sequestration as a part of ecosystem services, which was missing at the beginning. So this is a, once it's uh, including all those key elements, we could see ecological red, uh, red lining has a few significance in there. The first one, so this is a really the integrated spatial planning uh, for as a country as a whole, as a as a, uh, I think if the world can adopt the similar practices, that we could really manage what Marjorie mentioned when the species or pollution not going through the boundary, this kind of collective global movement, global management of spatial planning uh, could really be meaningful for, for our world. Second, uh, the ecological redlining is one way of conserving uh, the critical ecosystems. But that's also not only, there are also other measures we need to uh, conserve. I think in China, the strict, strict conservation of ecological redlining is one part, but also there are biodiversity ecosystems in other lines, in other like for agricultural land, for uh, urban uh, uh, land, biodiversity are all in there. Uh, the conservation of them are all, uh, all uh, are there as well. So therefore, the 25% of ecological redlining doesn't mean only 25% areas are managed. It's, I think it's a much more than that. The last thing I want to say, this global 30% and the 20% Chinese ecological redlining, what is that uh, a comparison? So as I still mentioned, the global 30% is a global goal. It's supposed to be land where the bio biodiversity are richest. We need to, global human humanity need to really work together. Then I think the world is now, science, uh, Joseph and all the other teams are really included, are really working on where are those 30% in which part of the world, which country has a more obligation, more um, uh, more knowledge and the capability to manage that. And how the world needs to really define, as I mentioned, define the targets. We go and define how to desegregate the targets to different countries and also how we build the system, financial or enabling condition, knowledge exchange or technology transfer to be able to co uh, collectively deliver that so that by 10 years ago, 10 years later, we don't say, oh, oops, we failed again. Let's, mm -hmm. Like we did uh, with IC target. So in a way, it's a, it's a significant move we see China has. I would see, like to see other countries who really stepping up, really push the envelope to see that we, you know, to pr protect the precious asset that we all have. Mm -hmm. Well, Miriam, in Europe, we have this uh, Europa Biodiversity Observation Network uh, that was launched to bridge the gap. I mean, people say, you know, there's on one hand, you have a lot of data. The other hand, you have a policy making uh, in terms of uh, uh, helping uh, protect the biodiversity. So how is it working, you know, using data to support policy making in that uh, respect? Well, it's essential that we have good data to be able to manage and to understand how the ecosystems are functioning and what are the consequences of human uh, actions on, on the long term. So what is um, important is that there is, um, in, in example, in, in, in UNESCO uh, sites, you have a scientific committee that is helping to provide information and the data. They are working in close cooperation with the coordinator and the manager of the World Heritage Site or the Geopark. And then they can talk uh, uh, to different governance scheme to make sure that the local communities are involved and they also part of the decision making. And then there is a clear understanding of where we want to go, what are the objectives of management, what is it we want to achieve, exactly what uh, Lin Ming was saying at the scale of a territory like a biosphere reserve, that there is a platform for discussion and that the science and the local and indigenous knowledge is fitting into the management action and that everybody understand their role and the consequences on the management of the uh, ecosystems or the site and take decisions about what are the priority for conservation, which species, which ecosystem, what are the priority for, for sustainable use. What is important in your uh, UNESCO perspective and coming back to what has been said is that uh, it's time for reconciliation. Um, we used to live in a, in a world, uh, maybe it has changed now with COVID-19, where you had science separated from local and indigenous knowledge. IBES has made the reconciliation. In the conceptual framework, you have the scientist point of view, but you also welcome indigenous and local point of view. This is essential in the way we're going to fix our issue. It's time for reconciliation also between urban and, and rural. 
we are not living in a separate world. We are living together. We have cases like in UK, close to Brighton, there is a the biosphere reserve. You have a lot of tourists coming to Brighton, but there are also rural farming and community gardeners that are helping to make sure that you can live in big cities, but also support the farming and the agriculture and, and the people who are living there. So again, it's time for reconciliation. We cannot oppose conservation somewhere by some people without humans and sustainable use elsewhere. This is what we need to do. It's a global reconciliation. Miriam, I'm, I'm wondering what, what, are, what are the lessons that you have? What are the lessons that you have for the world from the UNESCO World Heritage Sites, from the geoparks, from different projects that you've had? Are there key things that you've learned from that that you'd like to see transferred elsewhere? Yes, the first lesson is that there are human communities that are able to live without destroying, that we have some everywhere in every ecosystem, from arid zones to coastal area, People have learned to deal with their environment and they, are, they have lessons and they know how to develop, to thrive without destroying. Uh, we have, for example, uh, in the world heritage between Spain and, and uh, France, Mont Perdu, we're able to uh, transmit the knowledge about transhumans, a unique since the Middle Ages. So there are practices that are very ancient, that are still working and that, we, that preserve the, the ecosystems. You, or we are also able to restore, like Joseph said, we have to stop destroying because we, we, we should stop restoring. But whatever we can restore in mangrove in, in Vietnam, or for example, uh, um, in uh, in UK again, we have one uh, site, um, North Pennines in the UK. And this is where you have a restoration of peatlands. It's helping to absorb carbon. And just this restoration process is enabling that it's like the equivalent of not using 7,000 cars a year. So this is really important. So it works. We have success story about restoration of ecosystems. We have uh, stories and people who are able to conserve. What we need to do now is to do that everywhere and not again have this uh, um, idea that if the governments are committed to 30%, it means that the other 70% are going to be as business as usual. We cannot continue business as usual. We really have to transform the way we live together on Earth with the other living species. And that, again, we associate farming, agriculture, energy, the business, like Lilin said, that they are also responsible and accountable for the conservation of biodiversity. Conservation of biodiversity is not only in protected area. We can conserve biodiversity even living in cities. We do have at UNESCO cities like Dublin, part of Dublin, the capital city, is part of a biosphere reserve. This is where people live. This is where people drink. This is where people are working. This is our planet. Mary, I'm, I'm going to put this question to Josef, actually, which is about, pro to, inspired by what you're saying, do we actually start to need to put, put a, an economic cost on this, though? Ecosystem services are talked about a lot, but do we need to kind of price it in? We know that's um, being discussed related to carbon emissions? Do we need to price in the cost of nature in the products and things? Is that kind of economic angle going to help uh, establish the kind of world that, that Miriam's talking about? Well, I would say it would be quite important not lo no longer to externalize the cost you really have. So internalization means you put the cost inside the product. This means you have to, let's say, also pay for the environmental, let's say, damage you have caused by producing something. In the end, this would uh, uh, need in my, uh, lead, in my case, to, or in my, in my opinion, to conditions where, for example, organically grown food is much cheaper than the conventional one, if you really account for all the costs. So this is something which has to be, let's say, integrated. On the other hand, you have also this, this discussion about uh, say, putting price tags on everything, which I think is a bit uh, tricky, but it helps in the discussion, in mainstreaming the whole issue. So taking two examples, we have this pollination example globally. It depends on how you calculate. It's maybe 150 to 600 billion euros per year or dollars per year on a global scale, which is quite a massive amount, which is kind of approximation of how much value we take as granted from nature. Or if you take other figures, it's good to use them in the discussion. Taking the floods in Germany recently, the damage in these two or three valleys was 30 billion euros. So just to know this figure, so being preventive prevents spending all this money, which otherwise you can really save. So I think we need to use uh, economic arguments 
but we should not really uh, fall in the pitfall of uh, pricing each uh, single species, for example, which, let's say, downgrades them to something which is tradable, which is not the case. So it's kind of balanced thing of the economics, but you need, let's say, the, yeah, the internalization of costs for the products we consume and we, we, we trade. Hmm. Well, Yusuf, uh, I have a follow-up question, you know, basically on countries, uh, in terms of countries' participation in the global efforts on, on the biodiversity uh, conservation. Uh, we have this, uh, the Convention on Biological Diversity, or CBD, it's described as the one of the single, uh, you know, the single most important uh, international treaty on the biodiversity uh, conservation. But the U.S., uh, you know, the, the biggest economy is absent from this treaty, sort of like, uh, you know, uh, Paris climate change uh, deal uh, during Trump. So how will the U.S. absence somehow impact on the global efforts uh, of biodiversity uh, conservation? Well, that's really hard to answer, I would say. Uh, I think in terms of content, the U.S. are quite along the same lines because they have, for example, been partner in IPES in the process, so they are part of IPES. And... Uh, the decisions or the, the documents you finalized in the end in Paris in 2019 uh, was also agreed upon by the U.S. delegation. So I guess they're not too far away, but it's a pity that they're not part of the legal enforcing units. But I'm still optimistic they are following a, a similar direction. Ideally, of course, it would be, it would be great to bring them on board of CBD in the medium term as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, Marjorie, uh, you know, now we have the Biden administration. Are we expecting something different, you know, just like the U.S. return to the Paris Climate Change Accord? So the U.S. will join uh, this CBD, this very important uh, international treaty? Of course, we all hope so, that uh, we have uh, recognized how during the Trump uh, administration, you know, the world have to wait, uh, you know, almost like we for precious years uh, to combat climate change uh, since the U.S. is the um, uh, one of the largest emitter and uh, as the largest economy and uh, so it, uh, it 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 can have the power to put the uh, uh, to undermine the global solidarity so uh, so we do hope that uh, you know with uh, uh, with the president Biden coming back to uh, uh, to Paris and uh, uh, Paris agreement and uh, uh, and and now uphold a much more ambitious uh, climate uh, uh, climate target, climate goals. Uh, we also hope that uh, they could do more on the um, uh, uh, on the biodiversity side. Uh, having said that, uh, we also need to recognize that uh, uh, many of the um, uh, American brands and uh, companies uh, are the front runners uh, in trying to deal with uh, climate. Uh, both climate and biodiversity uh, 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 losses. So uh, I think there's a uh, there's a still a a, a broad uh, uh, still uh, uh, major opportunities uh, for uh, non-state collaboration to to take to uh, to uh, to be uh, achieved uh, through the uh, multi-stakeholder efforts. We're going to have to wrap up, wrap up pretty soon, but um, a question finally for Li Lin. You're actually there in Kunming, in China. Um, what's your perspective for next year, for when the, the main meeting happens in April? What are your big hopes for what can be achieved? Thank you. Yes, I am in action. You can see my background. I'm actually in the venue where it took place. Um, so yesterday, the Chinese Vice Prime Minister Han Zheng, in his opening speech, talked about the COP15 is places where the world leaders to really put utmost determination and a political will to address the biodiversity loss we have. I think that pointing uh, give a hope. And today, President Xi Jinping's announcement also give concrete measures China will take. China as a host country, COP15 is a one critical moment for China to play that host country role uh, to, to unite the different views in the world, trying to bridge the differences, understand the concerns, 
so that we can really have the global diversity framework agreed next year in Kunming that could be transformational and could be uh, ambitious, but still deliver the conservation result we all need. As the old panelists has mentioned earlier, we need a nature, we need a nature positive, we need more nature by 2030 than now so that we can sustain our development, our social, social culture, uh, heritage. So we, we need all that. I see that the, the COP team part one is already shows the signaling of traveling of that direction, which is really encouraging. What we need is we need to see all this, as I earlier mentioned, the political commitment I mentioned of so many countries by their leaders to really land them into the negotiations, into the discussion in this process, uh, you know, from now to the April uh, next year, to really translate in the global commitment, leaders' commitment, the need of the, the, the world of us to protect nature, to addressing the footprint, addressing the uh, conservation production, uh, consumption production patterns into the draft, into the GBF, because this is a one in a lifetime or this decade opportunity for us to really take seriously our action on nature. So it, at the COP15 part one side, I see hope. I see the direction of travel. I really would like to encourage to listen to this program, to work together, to encourage your government, your party, your negotiators to bring that what we need into the text of the convention so that we can all agree and implement so that we can really use that convention, use, sorry, use that global biodiversity framework to go the direction where we can live in harmony with nature. Well, thank you very much. I don't know about you, about Chin Chindo, but I'm, I'm excited about some of the ideas that have come forward here, this idea of being nature positive and how that can become a kind of buzzword, buzzword towards the end of the century. What do you think? Absolutely. Uh, in particular, I think this non-state factor, the business communities and also individuals with uh, the increasing awareness of, you know, you can do some contribution to the biodiversity uh, conservation. That's a very important message. Absolutely. Well, it's time to say goodbye. I'd like to thank all of our guests for such an insightful and engaging conversation. Thanks to Josef Satella from the Helmholtz Center for Environmental Research in Germany and it best the Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, and Miriam Boomeran from the United Nations Educational, Scientific and Cultural Organization, known to everyone as UNESCO. Goodbye, au revoir, and auf Wiedersehen from Euronews in Lyon, France. Well, thank you, Jeremy, uh, Yusuf, and Mariam, and many thanks also to our guests, Marjorie from the IPE and Dr. Lilian from WWF International. You can also watch us on the CGTN app on YouTube. I'm Xu Qinzhuo. Uh, goodbye from Beijing, China. Thanks for watching.